That's why I love young people. They just don't care what nobody thinks. They just do what they feel. Thank you guys. You guys are precious. Thank you so much. Where's that youth group tonight? Are y'all fired up for Jesus? <laughs> Lord, Lord, Lord. Now, I'll just tell you how you can be seated. I tell you, I felt a moment ago, when Pastor Jensen sings, you can feel it on his program when you're watching, but I thought, man, just preach. I thought he was going to have an anointing hit him right there. I said, I'll just sit back and fall. I'll lay hands on myself and fall out. That's how you do it, isn't it? But I want to say, my message tonight is, um, man, very special, especially when I get to the end of it, to uh, some, th some things I think I'm going to say that I didn't know I was going to say. Uh, but it, I can't express to you from a, a, a perspective of a 64 fellow who's been preaching for 47 years and seen many revivals. That's what I do. I don't, I'm not a, actually a pastor, but I, I, I travel. To be able one more time to see in 10 days a revival to hit a whole town. It is the most remarkable thing, and I want to honor God to express to him my appreciation. When you get about 65 and you've done this for 47 years, your, your body's tired. You can take all the B12 you want, but your body's tired. And um, I was at the point of being content of saying, you know, I'll just go back to some churches and preach and have my conferences in Cleveland, let people come to me. And uh, the Lord uh, just showed me that that doesn't have to happen that way. Also, I, I, Pastor, I guess I could mention about the month of December. Would that be okay? If you're on the West Coast, if you're anywhere in Orange County, if you're anywhere in Southern California, uh, I'm going to, I think pastor's going with me, but we're going to come to, if you're anywhere in Southern California, uh, I'm going to, I think pastor's going with me, but we're going to come to Free Chapel OCI, December 10th, 11th and 12th. Did I say that right? No. God, that's a habit. OCI is my ministry. I'm sorry. <laughs> Free Chapel, Orange County. That's why I had OCI, Orange County. And we're going to have revival out there. Now, when we've been there in the past, it's just like here. We can't get them in the building. One night, a thousand people wanted the baptism. I couldn't even step off the platform. But I want the people in Orange County to just start talking it now and pray now. And we don't know what's going to happen out there. You know, a lot of people wouldn't even try to have revival in the month of December. Let me tell you, God will have revival anywhere people are hungry. You know? So anyway, uh, man, I'm, 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 I, <laughs> bear with me. Because it's a very special word. And where's my Charlie? Charlie, if you'll look at the camera, I just want to say this real quick. I, I, I don't want to interrupt service, so I'm not doing that. I just want to, uh, what's that? Oh, a two-hour CD, uh, CD on the prayer language of the Holy Spirit. What it means to pray in the Spirit. Real quick, let's see what you got there. This one of my favorites, Secrets of the Third Heaven. Talks about everything in heaven when you pass away or when you go to the rapture. And number, the, what's the next one? Yeah, the journey through, the un, uh, through eternity, which takes you from your death to the, all the way through history, through the millennium, till, G, till the new Jerusalem comes down on the earth. All right, everybody ready? Say amen. amen. I, just, I felt so much of the glory. I don't know if I can stand up. If I fall out, I'm not dead, but you come and take the rest of it. Because I'm telling you, I'm, I feel the glory of the Lord in this place. Proverbs chapter 24, verse 16. Proverbs 24, 16. I think I'll read the verse first, 24, 16. And then give you the title of the message. And as sure as I'm standing here on a Wednesday night in Free Chapel in Gainesville, Georgia, this message is for some people here who need this desperately. Wow. I just heard the Lord tell me something. Somebody in the Franklin family, you guys, God just said, tell them the battle's about over. It's about over. Okay? It's about over. I heard it. Put that verse up again. Oh, for a just man, that could be a righteous man or a man attempting to serve God, woman, either one, falls seven times 
and raises up again, but the wicked will fall into mischief. What, that, what I would retranslate that to say is, but the wicked will fall and can't get up. I'm going to preach on getting back up when you've been tripped up. Oh, I heard somebody say, thank you. Where's that sister? We're going to preach together tonight. Hallelujah. I've been asked for many years, who are your favorite three characters in the Old Testament, not just in the Bible? And I believe I can tell you who the, whom the three are and why I have chosen and selected them. My favorite is Daniel, because Daniel was 17 years of age when he was taken into captivity and was given an opportunity at a king's table to compromise his beliefs of eating non-kosher food and also drinking the king's wine. And he being from the seed of God and from the seed of Judah said, I will not compromise at your table. Most people would have said, when you're in Babylon, do like the Babylonians. We don't want to offend anybody. I like him because if you'll look at his entire life, he was a non-compromiser when it came to trying to compromise with the systems and the thinking of the world. Number two is Job. What, what do I like the most about Job? The book of Job's 42 chapters, the man Job. His determination not to quit and not to give up. The devil didn't know him like God did. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Satan came and said twice, he's going to curse you. First of all, take his stuff. Secondly, take his health. He'll curse you. And God said in his own spirit, he is a spirit, and he said to himself, well, the devil just don't know him like I do. You can take everything he got and make him sick to the point of death. You'll never take his life, but go ahead. Put boils all over him because I'm going to tell you, when it's over with, I'm going to bless him with twice as much, and he ain't never going to say anything bad about me. And so the thing I like about him is his ability not to quit. It's one of the greatest spiritual warfare books in the Bible, by the way, is the book of Job. Number three is David. I think David probably is my favorite personality of the entire Bible because he's so human. He starts out as a shepherd, and God blesses him to be a king. And when you read the Psalms, it's just like you're reading parts of your own life, the having to forgive people, having to forgive yourself, learning how to trust God in crisis. And I like him because he shows real humanity. He shows what it's like to be a leader. He shows what it's like to repent. And I want to tell you what I like about David. He knew how to survive. Oh, thank you all five of you that know the story of David. I've said this. David is the poster child for the word restoration. I'm going to say it again. David is the poster child for the word restoration. And one thing about the Bible, you have to understand no Old Testament, New Testament, those 66 books. If there is a one theme, actually there's several themes of the Bible. Theme number one is covenant. The Bible is a covenant book from cover to cover and from, from chapter to chapter and from verse to verse. Number two, without a doubt, the Bible is a book of restoration. Adam and Eve no, no sooner fall in the Garden of Eden and God starts saying, I'm going to restore you one day with the seed of a woman that's going to defeat the head of the devil. And so it's a book of restoration. And, you know, David is an example of what I'm going to tell you, which will fall into the life of millions of Christians and maybe a lot of people watching me. He is the perfect example of a person that truly loves God with all his heart, but he fell into a horrible sin. Most of us, if you look at his life, he's doing everything he can to do everything right. I could show you chapter and verse, that's right, that's good, that's positive, that's right, that's good, that's positive. But he gets to one point in his life where he made one mistake that could have been fatal. And I think that's the thing that we all like about David is the fact that he shows us that good people can mess up. Let me talk about David for just a moment. Let me talk about him and his failure. David was, according to the Psalms, that he even mentions the middle of his life, but David was at midlife, and you've often heard people talk about people that have midlife crisis, and they are, they are real, they're not imaginary. David was at midlife when he had a terrible spiritual moral lapse at a moment of weakness. Now, David's situation was this. There was a time that kings went to battle, the Bible says, and David arose at eventide. I looked up eventide, and that was late in the afternoon. So basically, here's what he was doing. He was supposed to have been in a battle, but instead he was out of position. He was supposed to be in a battle, but he was letting other people fight his battles. 
So he was away from his assignment and away from where his position was that God had assigned him to. The second thing that you may not understand is David was having really serious marital issues. As a matter of fact, David had married King Saul's daughter. Saul made 21 attempts to kill David. David, um, Saul actually took that married wife of David and gave her to another man while David was fleeing him for 13 years in the wilderness. She even had children through that other man. And when David finally became king, he went back and got her because he said he loved her. But you know the story of how he brought the Ark of the Covenant back and she looked at a window and looked down on him. And when he got to the house, instead of her being in the parade of praise and worship, she looked at him and said, you crazy thing. Here you are showing yourself in front of all the young girls of Israel and showing off. What do you think you're doing? It says there he was clothed with a linen ephod. And an ephod was actually a priestly garment made of linen. And there's two kinds. There's one that goes all the way down to the ankle. And there's one that comes a little bit above the knee. And if she's criticizing him for hugging and bucking, come on, I hope, I hope it's not a bad word in Georgia. But if she's praising him for praise, she, you know, she criticizing him for praising God, I'll let you guess which one he had on. <laughs> It was probably the miniskirt. Come on, are you listening to somebody? <laughs> you know, them girls are looking at your legs. Are you trying to show off your hairy legs? I don't know what you're doing out there. You're trying to impress all the women. And he said to her, woman, let me tell you something. If you think I'm crazy now and my praise is loud and I'm wild now, you ain't seen nothing yet, so you just better get used to it. And the Bible actually said that David bear, she bare David no children. Now, she'd already had children. I can prove it from the Bible with another man, another husband. And he gets her back. You know what that means? That means that David maritally cut her off from physical relationships. I'm going to prove it to you. Where is his wife when he brings another woman into the bedroom in the palace? Oh, y'all are quiet in this house. I, I know I'm on the right subject tonight. It's awful quiet right now. Where was his wife, Saul's daughter, when he got Bathsheba and had the affair? He took her into the palace, into the bedroom, and there is no record of his wife saying anything or even being there. And I wish I had time to really dig this out. I could, I could preach 30 minutes on proving everything I'm saying to you. He cut off marital relations. I heard people say, God cursed her because she mocked David. No, God didn't curse her. He had no children through her because he didn't want to have the seed of Saul in his lineage. If he'd had child, children through her, it would have been a king sitting on the throne. And David knew that God had already cut off the house of Saul. There was to be no more descendants of Saul on the throne. It was going to be the house of David. So guess what happens? It gives him an opportunity to try to find a wife that will bear a child. But instead of finding a single woman close to his age, he finds a married one. How many know what I'm preaching tonight? Raise your hand if you know the Bible. Raise your hand if, if you know the Bible. If you don't, I'll try to explain it to you in simple terms. He was worn out from all of the battles that he had fought for 13 years with Saul, with the Philistines, with, with enemies. He was tired of fighting, and he needed a new thrill, and he was at midlife. Now, let me say this. David is the example that proves that if you ever fail or mess up, you are going to get labeled by your failure. I want to go through BF before the failure, and I want to go AF after the failure. Here we go. Before the failure, at age 18, David was a mighty man of God called a warrior that could take a rock and a rag and deck a 12-foot giant and cut its head off. By age 19, he is called a psalmist. He is taking a harp and playing demons out of the king of Israel and refreshing him simply by playing the harp. By age 20, he's a military hero. The women of Israel are saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his tens of thousands. By age 22, he's leading men all over the place. There's 600,000 men that are hanging around him who are wanting to leave Saul 
Saul and fight with David because they know he's a man of destiny. But by age 30, he is anointed the king of Israel. By age 35, he has built a tabernacle on Mount Zion. And he has praise teams 24 hours a day. There's only one chapter in the Bible about it. Praise teams 24 hours a day. And they're singing. And most of the Psalms that you read in the book of Psalms were written by several men at the tabernacle who would get near the Ark of the Covenant. Oh, speaking of the Ark, he brought the Ark of the Covenant from Shiloh or Shiloh back to the city of Jerusalem, put it inside that tabernacle, and they'd get in there and begin to worship in God. Somebody be playing a lyre, somebody be playing a harp, somebody might be blowing on a trumpet, and all of a sudden, they, and the Spirit of the Lord says unto thee this day, and they write Psalms, and they write the verses that are in your Bible because they got in the presence of God on top of Mount Zion in a tent near, a, near something called a tabernacle, near something called the Ark of the Covenant, and the glory came in, and David, that's why he was a man after God's own heart, because he understood they're worshiping God in heaven 24 hours a day. I'm going to set up a tent of worship 24 hours a day. What a man. Nobody could whip him. They were afraid of him. What a man. Well, he gets to midlife, and he falls into what's called a self-appointed trap. And because he committed adultery with Bathsheba, another man's wife, he wants to cover it because she's pregnant, so he takes the man, the husband, brings him to Jerusalem, hoping he'll sleep with her, and that way it will look like it's his baby. But the man never went into the house. He slept at the door of the palace. He said, if the men of Israel are intense, I can't, can't go into my wife. David even made, made him drunk trying to get him to do that. He didn't do it. So now David is in a real precarious situation. He's got another a man's wife pregnant. The man did not have relations with the woman. He'd been in a battle. So he's got to cover it. So the only way to cover it is to kill the husband. So he tells one of his generals, he said, put your eye on the front line. You know, he's a good fighter. Man, he'll take the enemy out, but that wasn't the plot. That wasn't the strategy. The strategy was frontline men, front men are often the first men killed in a warfare. Word got back that he was killed. Well, David wanted to comfort the wife. He marries her, and he's approached by a prophet one day, Nathan the prophet, who gives him a parable. Now, I want you to understand this parable because this parable gave David an opportunity before he ever was exposed by Nathan, it gave him an opportunity to pronounce his own judgment. You didn't hear me. God gave David the opportunity to pronounce his own judgment. There was a man that had one lamb. He was a very poor man. But there was another man that was very rich and had many lambs. And the man that had many lambs went and stole the one from the poor man and put it in his flock. What shall be done to this man, David? And David who would do a thing like that? He shall restore four times. And Nathan said, you're the man. What was the four times he had to restore? He lost the baby when it was born, and he lost three sons. Because the prophet said, the sword of the Lord will never depart his house. You know, here's the thing about full disobedience. It's not an issue of whether anybody in this house can be forgiven of anything except blasphemy of the Holy Spirit that has never forgiven us. It's never an issue. Forgiveness has never been the issue. The issue is the repercussion. And there's some people that do some stupid things. A guy steals a car and he goes down the interstate at 120 miles an hour with three helicopters and 50 police cars behind him. And then runs out of gas, then gets out of the car and jumps the fence knowing he's going to escape while five cameras are live on the news showing you what house he went to. <laughs> and a man locally actually went into a bank with a clown's mask on and said, give me your money and give me in all the bills under there. And the woman said, Billy, what are you doing with the clown's mask on trying to rob the bank? She knew who he was because she grew up with him. People can do some things that really don't even make sense because 
the human mind under certain types of pressure becomes irrational. Boy, I, I'm preaching to seven people here, but you, we'll, we'll help the seven here in a minute. Let me say this. The human mind under certain types of pressure will act irrational. So that was, that was BF before the fall. Let me tell you about the fall. Now, I know I'm preaching stuff that a lot of you've already heard, but we're going somewhere with this. He was then called an adulterer. That was a fact. He was then being called by people of Israel a murderer. That was a fact. He was considered a failure now as king. You know what? Guess what? That's a fact. He was being called hypocrites, a hypocrite by, to people, people that knew him, people that grew up with him, some of his mighty men. Guess what? That's a fact. He was forsaken by his own friends. Guess what? That is a fact. And everything they were saying was true. All the feelings they felt negatively were true. But it came to me one day mm -hmm, that something can be a fact but not be the truth. I'm going to say it again. Something can be a fact, but not be the truth. Here's a fact. Satan is a fallen angel. Here's a fact. Satan is a king over the prince of darkness or the kingdom of darkness in the earth. Here's a fact. Satan has a kingdom with four demonic spirits. Here is a fact. Satan is active in the earth today. But the Bible said the truth ain't in him. Ah, uh, so he's a fact, but the truth is not in him. So I want you to understand something that in your personal life, you have things that are facts. You have failed. That's a fact. You have wanted to quit. That's a fact. You felt like giving up. That's a fact. You are embarrassed. That's a fact. You're full of shame. That's a fact. You wish you hadn't done it. That's a fact. But I've come by to tell you that there comes a time when the truth takes over the fact. And let me tell you about the truth. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, and I am the life. Let me tell you about the fact. The Bible tells us uh, the, the, the facts are one thing, but it says thy word is truth. You want to understand what truth is? It's the Bible. You want to understand whom truth is? It's God. You want to understand what truth is? It's Jesus. You want to understand what truth is? It's what he says about uh, what he says about you. So let me talk to you this way. I know the facts have said you're a drug addict, but the truth says I can make you free. Hey, the fact says you are sick and dying, but the truth said I am the Lord God, the healer, and by my stripes you are healed. Uh, the truth said the storm is going to wreck your house, but the truth says get me in your house and I'll say peace be still and the storm is going to go away. The fact says that one day you're going to die and be buried, but the truth says I am the resurrection and the life. Hey, the fact says the devil is prophesying to me and he's telling me I'm not going to make it but the truth says not only are you going to make it you're going to make it always that's railways, highways, skyways byways, waterways, walkways anyways, everyways oh, you better help me in that balcony get excited about the truth because the truth will always conquer the fact Come on, let's take a praise break right now. I feel the anointing. Come on, I said I feel the anointing. Don't quit, don't quit. Praise him, praise him. Pray, I said praise him. Oh, hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus. Woo. 
<laughs> I should save this verse for just a minute, but I'm going to give it to you now. I'm going to give you this very strange verse. Isaiah 9, 5. I believe I have this in the King James, gentlemen, I believe. Whew. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise and the garments rolled in blood. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. And I read that verse in the English translation. In fact, I had a friend of mine, Jason, was talking about this and was reading this one day and it didn't make sense. Okay, I can understand this part. For every battle of the warrior is with confused noise. Every battle, whether it's being in a hospital and the doctor giving you a bad diagnosis, you will then begin to hear confused voices in your head, especially if it's cancer or leukemia or a, a disease. One voice will say, you know, people have been healed of this. One voice will say, you know, God can heal this. One voice will say, you need to get people praying. You need to tell people to pray with you. And then you will hear, well, you know, you had three relatives die with the same thing. You're next. And yet someone will come in, oh, honey, we're praying for you. We know you're going to ha you have a hard way ahead of you. And all of a sudden, the battle of the warrior is confused with voices and confused with noise. You're praying for your child. I don't know if you know this. The other day, we had a lady here in the service from Cleveland, Tennessee, and she lost two sons. One was through a suicide. And one took a pill. A kid bought him a pill to help him sleep, and it was laced with fentanyl, and he died on Christmas Day. One little pill. One tiny pill. So here you go, and you have two children who have died, and then you see two children that almost died that lived. You hear a testimony of a child that was about to commit suicide but is now on fire for God, and the devil will confuse the voices. Leave that verse up. Thank you, sirs. He'll confuse the voices, and he'll try to contradict the promises of God by sending other people's voices into you. Huh. You're praying for your marriage to hold together. You're believing it. But then the enemy will tell you, well, your sister's marriage split up. Why are you any different? See that woman on the front row? That's my wife. Raise your hand, Pam. I want That woman I'm walking out with every night. It's my wife, Pam. Give her a hand. She, de she deserves it staying with me 42 years. <laughs> okay. My, my mother, I'm going to talk about some practical things. Bear with me for a minute. My mother, as you know, we had a, the COVID virus took a lot. Who lost a loved one through COVID? Raise your hands. A lot of people. Yes. Well, my mother got a cold and she started coughing and she started getting a fever and she starts saying, having breathing problems, and it lasted two weeks, and she was getting worse. Now, I hate that this is the last conversation with my sweet Italian mother, but this was my last conversation. I walked over to the house and opened the door, and I was five foot. I said, Mom, listen to me. Now, you know what's going around, right? Yeah. <laughs> and I said, you're not getting better, right? She said, no, I'm not. I said, you got two choices. Stay here in the house and go to heaven in a few days or go to the hospital, and let's see what they can do. And, and she didn't want to go. In fact, she did go at the beginning and went home, wouldn't let them do anything. They put her on a ventilator, and she was actually getting better. The doctor said, you know, she's a strong-willed woman, and it looks like she's clearing up, and, and, and she's getting better. It looks like she was getting better. I'm sitting on a Tuesday night at Omega Center International, Cleveland, Tennessee, right there, and my, Pam's phone's going off. And she doesn't ever look at her phone during church. I said, baby, your phone keeps going off. And it says, Cleveland Hospital. I said, uh-oh. And we, we, she slipped out. And they said, tell Perry his mother just had a heart attack on the vent. And you might want to get up here now because she's, she's going to go tonight. As I'm driving over there, and I think my mother's spirit was already gone. You can tell if this person's spirit has left the body by talking to them and watching the machines. If the spirit is still there, there will be heart movement will, will start increasing and, the, and everything else will increase. But when, 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 when they have them on a heart machine and you're talking to their, in their ear, talking in their ear, because hearing is the last thing to go. Is God not cool to make hearing the last thing to go that you can talk to them? When, they can't, when, they're, when they're in a coma, they can still hear you. I know that for a fact from coma victims. So get in their ear and talk to them. But I started talking and I said, Pammy, 
She's left us. <laughs> she's already gone. I can tell you by the monitor she's gone. So I'm standing there saying to myself, what if I had some stuff that when I got COVID, I took from a doctor in Texas. It was natural. And I got better in two days. And I said, I should have given her this. Why didn't I get Pam? Why didn't I think? And I'm, I'm, I'm self-condemning myself. But my mama at 83 had broke her wrist and broke her arm and, and had a hard life the last two years. And the Lord said, you know what? She's rejoicing now. So don't be upset. When she left that body and got to heaven and saw her husband, who was good looking, by the way, when he was old, but he had to be hot when she got to heaven because he looked good at 30. He looked like a movie star. Excuse me. I'll talk about my dad that way. Thank you. Very handsome man. So then one day, Pam had some symptoms. This is how long ago was this, honey? Can, I, can you give me an idea? April 21. And I walked in and she said, Perry, something's not right. So what do you mean, baby? She said, when I breathe, something's not right. Well, she had one of those little meters and her oxygen went from 98, 95, 90, 85, and it was dropping. And I said, honey, what do you want to do? I said, I know we got stuff we can take here and we should have already been taking it, but what do you want to do since this? She said, well, let me, let me go to the, to the hospital and see what they'll do. And we called an ambulance. I have a picture on my phone. And as she's going out there, on the ambulance, I felt okay. I felt like she would be okay. But when she got to that hospital, she spent five days there. And she would not turn on a TV and start listening to COVID numbers. She, she texted Faith Cutshaw and she said, I want you to send to me every song you know that's a worship song. And my wife kept her phone charged, right, baby? And all she did was listen consistently to praise and worship music. She didn't want the statistics that somebody just died, somebody died again, somebody's mama died, somebody's grandma died. But I'm going to talk about, let's keep that scripture up, guy. I know I keep going back to it. But the battle of the war is what? With confused noise, voices. Here's a woman of God that God's not through with. I knew it. I think she knew it as well. But she is hearing the enemy say, Three Church of God leaders died with this in their 50s. Look, you're a little older than them. What makes you any different? Do you think, Pam Stone, because you're married to a preacher, that you're better? Did you not hear about the pastor's wife that died down in Alabama? And I said, honey, five days of this. What did you do? She said, I listened to music. And every time that voice came to fight me, I said, no, in the name of Jesus. Every time. She said, every time I said, no, I'm not taking that. No, I'm not accepting that. No, I'm not accepting that. No, I'm not accepting that. Well, needless to say, and I give God the glory, she's with me right here. She's here tonight, and she's well because of the power, all, really because of the power of God. There were some good doctors. We give them honor as well, but it, here she is, because I told God. I said, you know what? I ain't living without that woman. No, I, listen, you all don't understand. She not only takes care of the house, cleans the clothes, buys my clothes. I do not even know what I make because she gets the check and she takes care. She pays all bills. I do, not, I do not have a checkbook to write a check out with. That's the truth. Can I tell you this? I'm going to put my hand on the Bible. Oh, well, hmm. ain't no Bible up here. <laughs> This my, I got my Bible on my laptop. I put my hand up here, though, represent. I, don't even, I do not, if you paid me $10 million, tell us what you make as a salary. I do not know because I've never seen the check. Pam, raise your hand if I'm telling the truth because she knows. She pays me $500 a month cash. That's why I dress like this, okay? If you don't like the outfit, now you know why I'm dressing these crazy looking outfits, $500 a month. <laughs> Honey, you can go ahead and raise your hand on that because that's probably pretty true. I get about 500 on average. <laughs> Look at her. She, she smiled. <laughs> I, you know what she's saying right now? She's going, <laughs> I'm going to kill you when I get you in the green room. <laughs> you just wait, boy, I'm going to get you. <laughs> oh my goodness. I'm going, to go, I'm, going to, I'm going to refer back to this in a minute, but I'm going, to, I'm going to show you this verse. It says, And the garments are rolled in blood, 
Have you ever felt like you've been stabbed in the back? Betrayed. People lamb blasting you, saying things about, look, I can handle truth, but I'm not one that gets into lies about me. I'll fight that back if I have to. God fights it, but sometimes you have to. But this shall be with burning and fuel of fire. So I checked out, and I don't want to go to any other translations, but I checked some Hebrew, some Greek, some other translation. And let me tell you what this appears to be saying. Now listen to this. It appears to be saying, when you go through the battle and all the voices are confusing and the enemy is telling you everything he can tell, if you will hold on, then your battle will turn into fuel for a fire in you that fights the enemy back. Your battle fuels your anointing. God, I felt the Holy Ghost all over me when I said that. You want to be anointed? Can I tell you how you're anointed? You're anointed by a crushing. There's a level of anointing you get when you get the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I've had people walk up to me, and I th I'm, I'm thankful that they respect the ministry. But I've had young preachers say, Brother Stone, I want your anointing. I said, write it, write it down. I'm going to tell you how to get it. Number one, clean commodes. Because before I ever got called to preach, I cleaned commodes at my dad's church. Number two, preach at children's church. Because for three years, I taught a children's church at my dad's church with a bunch of little kids with cutouts. We didn't have anything like we've got today. And I said, number three, go through hell. Oh, no, preacher, I don't want to go through hell. But I'm going to tell you something. If you want my anointing, you're going to get my battles because you can't get the anointing that I've had unless you have go through some of the battles that I've gone through. And when you see Jensen Franklin and you see anointed men, it's not something we bought. It's not something we purchased. We're just not blessed and charismatic and got good personalities. If you ever hear somebody preach to you, under the anointing, you can say to yourself, dear God, what kind of price have they had to pay in their warfare for God to put them on a platform and let the anointing of the Holy Ghost come? And since, the, since olive oil in the Bible represents the anointing, they didn't anoint people with water or wine or grape juice. They anointed them with oil from olive trees. So if you want to know what the anointing cost, interview an olive. <laughs> because here's what your little olive would tell you. Oh, I was on that beautiful tree and the sun was coming up and the rain would fall and the mist in the morning and all those other olives were there with us and we were so comfortable and everything was so nice and beautiful and people would come and brag on our beauty and even the leaf of an olive, as you know, insects can't bite it and destroy it because it has a substance in it that is bitter to them. So we're protected by the leaves. No insect destroys us. And then one day we start changing our color. We got from, from green to very dark, and we thought, wow, well, that's interesting, but they're still bragging on us, and these men would come and look at us, and I heard one, one day say, it's ready, <laughs> and all of a sudden, this machine came and grabbed our, the trunk of the tree and started just violently shaking us, and I'm trying to hold on by that stem, and it, I can feel myself giving in. I'm trying to hold on a little bit longer. I'm hoping all of them that are falling in that net in the ground, I'm hoping that I'm not going to be one of them. I don't know what they're doing with us. We're supposed to hang on a tree and look cute and look pretty, and everybody's supposed to brag on us how nice we are, how good we are, and how precious we are. But no, I fall off the tree, I break my stem, and I end in a net with a bunch of other olives, and we're just looking at each other saying, what is this about? <laughs> and so this big husky man then folds up that net, throws it over his shoulder, and he drags it to somewhere I had never seen, and I had never been. It's a brand new place. And we look, and it's a bunch of stone rock buildings. And then they got this weird-looking thing that's round, and it has a big, long log, and it has a big, round rock, and he just dumps us all together on this round thing. And I'm looking at my buddy saying, what is this? He said, I have no clue. All I've ever known is an olive tree. Me too. 
And then all of a sudden, um, two men take that long pole and they start walking and walking and we see it coming. And I look in front of me and all my buddies are being completely crushed. What are they doing to us? We don't deserve this. We're just little old olives. And he says, it gets to me and I feel the weight of this, this stone, round stone object. And I get all of a sudden crushed. But you know, there's something really weird that happened because when the crushing started, something started coming out of me that I didn't know I had. And said, I thought one time was enough, but no, they did it four times because I found out that that little seed on the inside of me that I was protecting had the most oil in it. That's a fact, by the way. So when they finally got to that seed in me and that seed that I had carried in me felt the crushing, all of a sudden they said, okay, we're done. And they took that oil and the first part of it went to light the menorah in the temple. True story. And then they took the second part of it and they used it for medicine to put on the wounds of the hurting. True story. In Jesus' day. Old Testament. <laughs> and said, then, then that, they would, that, that, wasn't, that wasn't all of it. And then they took the oil and they cooked with it and they made food and then they made a light inside their house. So if you want to know what it costs to have a worldwide ministry or be anointed, it costs you everything. It costs you, it costs you your family time. It costs being away on holidays, away from your grandbabies. It cost everything. So if you want to know what it takes, when you feel like everything has messed up, just remember this. Only the wounded know what it's like to be wounded. And only... Only the wounded can effectively heal someone else who's been wounded. And the reason that the Lord allows ministers to be crushed at times is because you can begin to feel the hurt of others. Now my story, and I won't, I'll, I'll be very vague with this. I won't go into details because I'll just tell you, I had, <clears throat> and this is my closing for many years, many years, if you think about this for a moment, one of my projects was to take the entire Bible and write a commentary on it. That Bible that's out there that's a New Testament that thick and an Old Testament that thick took me seven years to write a million word commentary to the point that I would go home after 15 hours of writing and I would see a computer screen when I closed my eyes blinking. I could see the words on the screen. I would see the keyboard. I, I looked at the keyboard so much that seven years off and on when I would try to sleep at night, I couldn't sleep because I saw a keyboard. At the same time, I was under contract by a major publisher to publish seven books in three and a half years. So I published three books a year beside doing the study Bible commentary that took seven years. And then... I was doing conferences at that time, just going all over the country doing conferences. And in my conferences, there was 150 brand new messages that I prepared every year with PowerPoint usually, meaning I, I had to design the pictures that we'd show because I never preached the same messages in any conference for years and years, never. And then a VOE magazine, I laid out the magazine, which was 20 to 24 pages every two months. And then I had to answer emails. And then I had to answer letters. Me, I didn't have... I have good staff, but I had to do it. They would always come to me. What do you want to say? What do you want to put? What do you want to do? That's only the start. Every, Israel every year, 40 messages for Israel, plus 100. No, in Israel, I taped 300 YouTube videos. That was one trip. 
So everything was electronic, everything was computer, and I thought I was doing okay. And then I got really wore out in my head. And I want to tell you, preachers, I never took a sabbatical. I never took a that time off. I took two vacations a year, and that was my vacation. And every weekend, oh, I forgot to tell you this, every weekend, 35 weekends in 2019, I preached six to eight messages on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, every weekend, got to the office at three and four o'clock in the morning on Monday and left Friday in a plane to do it all over again for years. And one day in 2020, in the month of January, I was in, I had a lodge. It's a three-story lodge. There were four, five offices there with staff. And I went to walk across. Now look, this triggers something in me. So forgive me if I feel like I'm trying to catch my breath. If you've ever if you've ever been through trauma, you'll, you guys in the war, you know what I'm saying. You see it in it. So bear with me a minute. And I went to walk Jensen across normal and everything in me went out of me. My whole strength went out and I fell to the floor. And I didn't even tell my wife this. I was embarrassed. And I drug myself over and grabbed a Bible and laid down sideways thinking, well, I just need to rest a little bit. And I couldn't, I couldn't sleep. Pam will tell you, I was waking up at three or four in the morning. I'd get up and go to work. There was nobody there. My, my own workers didn't get there till five and a half hours later, four and a half hours later. I'd be the last one to leave. Charlie, am I telling the truth? Raise your hand. You're my, you're my office manager. He knows. And I realized something had happened to me, and they, they call it different things, but I'm just going to call it pure spiritual, mental, emotional burnout. When you get burnt out, I want to tell you, you better watch it and be careful and stop what you're doing. You will start making very bad decisions. And I won't go into detail about this because this was part of the trauma I went through. I got ambushed by some people, not, not with knives and guns, but with words, ambushed. It's the only way for me to describe it. And I was having a nervous breakdown and people taped it and gave it to a newspaper. Uh-huh people I trusted my life with. I couldn't believe it. And then they edited it to say what they wanted it to say. In fact, I've had federal agents tell me I have a lawsuit if I want it, federal lawsuit. One guy could get at least five years in prison right now, and I won't go there. I'm not going to go there. I got too much to do and too many important things to do to go there. You don't have to. That's okay. I just, I just wanted to say that. That's just my opinion. But it was hell. And I got so tired and so weak and so weary that my board said, you have got to go away to a, to a doctor. And uh, when, I, when I went away, I remember just shaking the whole time. And they put me on a plane. <laughs> and I was shaking. <laughs> Pam remembers this. And my wife was crying. And I'm crying. I said, what's going to happen? What, what's happening to me? What's going to happen? And I got out there to a, a certain clinic, and I had to stay 30 days out there. And, uh, and, I, and I, I asked for counseling. I asked for help. I said, find out. And they just said, man, you have, you've lived your whole life with rejection. Jensen knows a little bit about that in our, in our life. And they said, you've always wanted people to like you for Perry and not for the preacher Perry. Now, Mark Casto, stand up. You were my youth pastor for how many years? Nine years. Am I telling the truth? I wanted people to like me. Mark knows this whole situation for Perry and not Perry the preacher. And I didn't know how to do that. I had a doctor look at me and he said, Mr. Stone, I want to show you, show you your numbers. Your A1C is 14. Your sugar is off the hook. Your blood, let's see, my blood pressure was 220 over 140. And he said, I do not know how you're not in a coma or a stroke. You are right now on the verge of having a stroke that you will never talk or preach again. And he, they, they did my heart thing. I had five little blockages in my heart. I had a brain tumor called a melangenoma on the top of my brain. And he said, if you do not readjust yourself in two years, you will die and never see your daughter married. But I didn't know. I didn't know how to do that, man. I had, I had a pattern developed. So I told Pam, I said, I preached for 60 years, 44 uh, years at that time. I've had a great run. I'm going to quit. I'm going to quit. I'm going to enjoy my babies. I'm going to enjoy my grandbabies. I'm going to travel with you. We're going to have fun. I'm done. And I was ready to give up a ministry valued at $80 million and just hand it over to whoever wanted it. 
I was burnt out. I was suicidal. I got to a point that if, if I'd have died, I would have felt relief because I don't know if you understand what total burnout is. It is the worst feeling. You, you take the worst depression you've been through and add it about 20 times. And then you're being attacked, attacked, just everything, all at once. And then one day, <laughs> my phone, my cell phone rang, and I knew it had to be somebody I knew. And I looked at the name, and it said Steve Muncy, one of my dear pastor friends. When Steve, hey, Steve, Steve said, hey, buddy. And he said, now, I don't want you to say anything. I just want to tell you, this is a conference call with five of your friends. I said, well, who are they? Me, Marcus Lamb, Ted Shuttlesworth, uh, Rich Wilkerson, and Jensen Franklin. And I knew I had five men there that loved me. And I knew I had five men that had my back and they cared about me. And we talked for a while. We talked. And every one of them, every one of them had a word. And I'm going to tell you, Jensen, had that call not come, I would have, I'd have walked away from the ministry, burnt out by people, by staff, some, some staff, I should say, burnt out, burnt out by rejection, and I would have just retired. And I want to say something. I told God, I don't ever have to have another big meeting. I don't need that. You've already, I've, I've had my run. I can do, I, you know, I'm happy. I'm happy. And I'm, I'll be happy preaching in churches because our crowds are usually great. People get saved and filled with the Holy Ghost. But I'm going to tell you something. <laughs> when I came here 10 days ago, on Sunday night, my intention was just to give you the best word I could give you. And when pastor got up and said, I think we should go on. I didn't know what to expect. He didn't know what to expect. And on this 10th night, I needed this for me. You needed it for you. Pastor got a refreshing. I needed this meeting. Just be seated for a moment. Let me say this to you. Because when I preach to you, he restoreth my soul. It, you're hearing it now not from a Bible message. You're hearing it from a man who knows what it is. When I say to you, restoration. In this revival, you know 10 days has been what, Jensen? Repent and restoration is what it's been. You know why? You know why? You know why? You know why you feel it? Because I'm not just giving you a sermon. I'm preaching out of my pain that I've been through. And I'm preaching out of my healing I've been through. And I want every one of you to know, <laughs> no matter where you have failed, if it is physically a breakdown, if some of you folks have worked yourself all these years and you just feel like you're at the edge of a burn, I'm talking to business people, you're at the edge of a burnout. If you've been in ministry and you've been volunteering for the church and you feel like, man, I, I do all this work and nobody's noticing. Are you kidding me? God has a record. Every Parker, every nursery worker. If it was a moral failure and you just feel like you can't recover, I could go through 10 types of failures that are represented here tonight. I just want you to know that God is never against you, that God is for you and everything he, listen to this, and this is important, everything he allows you will look back on and realize it was for a purpose. Even my thing, do you know, I have learned balance. I have learned to do things. I have learned to avoid things. I have learned to eat better till I come here. And I want to do something because I just feel like I've got some burnout people in your spirit, in your mind. 
And I don't want anybody to leave because I want you to stay here, stay here with us in the altars. This thing gets kicks, just starts getting kicked up here in a minute with the anointing. And I want you to get ministered to. But on the count of three, if you say, Perry, I feel like I'm in a total burnout. I feel like I'm making really crazy decisions. And, I, I, and I'm saying to myself, what are you doing? I feel like the enemy has me under some kind of an, a mental attack. And I'm trying to get free. And I just cannot get free. Anything like that. And anything that fits this situation we're preaching on from beginning to end. When I say three, you stand up and you come down. I need the altar workers down here first. Would you come please first, please? Uh. <laughs> Amen. Amen. You don't know what the Lord will do. So hang with us because you may be the one that's not even coming down here that God will get a word for here in a second. So just hang with us a minute. On the count of three, if you need prayer, come on, one, two, three. Come on right now. If a, let me say something. If your marriage, if you feel like your marriage is in trouble, you know, husbands and wives, just come on down here. Nobody's gonna, nobody's gonna judge you. This is not a church that judges. So come on down here. There's prayer we folks all the way down here. God, we're going to restore some, some of you and restore your soul. And if you feel like you've even been tripped up at some point, if you feel like you've been tripped up and you've been in a battle, all right? Fill up the whole front as much as we can. Fill up the whole front as much as we can. Jensen, once again, people are coming just all over. Amen. Amen. Oh, my, my, my. Oh. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. I'm going to have everybody to pray a prayer after me, but it does not end. We, we do not go back to our seat after we pray. Then I want you to pour out your brokenness before God and let him hear what you have to say. Okay? And uh, they're still coming. They're still Now, this is a restoration night for somebody. Somebody needs this really desperately. All right, everybody that's in the aisle, everybody that's in the front, would you, and we lift our hands not out of, out of habit, we just pray that way because the Bible said, I would that you would pray lifting up holy hands without any wrath or doubting. So when you put your hand up, this is a sign of faith. It's a sign, God, I'm looking to you to help me. So raise your hand and say this prayer out loud with me. Dear God in heaven, my heavenly Father, I thank you for this word. You've touched me through your word. But Lord, I need some help tonight and for the days ahead. I believe, Lord, that the enemy has tried to wear me down and wear me out. And in my spirit, my mind, my heart, my body, I have felt like an attack I can't deal with. And I'm asking you in the name of Jesus to put the Spirit of God in me, the Word of God to rise up in me, faith to rise up in me, that the enemy will be defeated. My attack will become my zeal to fight back. I believe Jesus is going to deliver me. He's going to help me. I forgive everyone, Lord, that I need to forgive, Lord. I release them now. Don't let me hold a grudge toward my enemy. Save my enemy. Deliver my enemy. Help them to get healed. Don't let me be a bitter Christian, Jesus. Don't let me hold stuff from the past, Jesus. I want to be free again. I want to have the joy again. I want to have the peace again. In the name of Jesus, everybody jump to your feet and put your hands toward the people. Up in the balcony, put your hands toward the people. And now begin to pray. Everybody begin to pray on your own.
just worship him, worship him. Father, we thank you because as they're praying, that your, your, your ear is open to their cry. We thank you, God, as they're praying, that you're hearing what they say. We thank you, Lord, that every voice is activated. Every mountain is moved by voice activation. And as they activate their faith and their voice, God, that you're going to move on their behalf. You're going to deliver them from the power of the enemy. You're going to deliver them, God, in Jesus' name, from the lie and the adversary, the lie of the adversary. I command them to be lifted up from where they're at. I command God to, woo, I command you to be pulled out of that pit by faith. I'm asking you, God, to reach your hand down and touch them and lift them up by faith. Lift them up by the power of God. Lift them up by the power of the Spirit of God. Holy Ghost, in Jesus' name, don't you let one of them leave with the bondage that they came here under. Don't let one of them leave, Heavenly Father, with the captivity that they feel that they're under. We loose you in the name of Jesus. We free you by the blood of Jesus. We command the powers of Satan and demon spirits. Come out in the name. I said come out. Foul spirits, come out. touch you up in the balcony you need your touch anybody in the overflow you need your touch so don't worry about who's beside you open up your mouth and begin to pray in the Holy Ghost for five or six minutes open up your mouth and begin to worship the Lord
Because we're not through. How many of you want to go to Friday night? Let's go to Friday night. Let's just step on out on the water. What we got to lose? I don't want to look back and say, wonder if. I, I, I don't have any more time to waste. I don't have nothing more important to do. Don't have anywhere more important to be than right here at the feet of Jesus. This is what I long for. This is what I live for. Can you stay till Friday? All right. All right. Let's talk about this. All right. So, <laughs> this is crazy. Okay. So, so you can do tomorrow night yeah, and okay. you can do Friday. Yes, yes, yes. Absolutely. And uh, let's do it. You good? It's good. Good. Hey, we love you. I love you so much. We love you, Pam. We love the stones. I know, we love those family folks too. You know that. Boy, I just heard a song in my ear. Be flat. Where in the world did this come from? Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsty of my soul. Bread of heaven. That's what you've been feeding us. Feed. I won't know. Here's my cup. Fill it up and make me whole. I hope I can remember this. Like the woman at the well. Well, thank God for these things. I was seeking for things that could not. I tried, but they just could not satisfy. Oh, but then, while Perry Stone was preaching, I heard my Savior say, come drink from this well that never shall run dry. Throw your hand up. Here's my cup, Lord. I lift it up, Lord. Beautiful. Sing it like a big choir. Fill it 
and make. And I don't know if they got this verse, but that last verse was the one that always got me. Listen to this. I hope I can remember it. If I don't, I'll make it up. There are millions in this world. This is why we need to go another two nights, at least. There are millions in this world who are craving, searching, seeking from things that do not satisfy. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ, my Lord. He is my Lord. Sing it, church. I being weird you're glowing there's a can y'all see that not like a like but there's just a glow on Jensen's face you know what that usually means that your wife's pregnant I'm gonna do like Moses I'm gonna get a veil cuz that that, ain't, that don't need to happen amen grandbabies yes yeah in all seriousness it, I, we didn't plan this until you just said it a moment ago, but we're available to do that and we will. But let me say this. I found a message today when I was looking through some things and I said, oh dear Lord, that's got to be preached here. And I said, well, you know, we're closing. Maybe, maybe some other time. I'm going to preach that in the next two nights. This is, this is Holy Ghost wild. It's got a prophetic tent, a prophetic side to it, so don't you miss it. Don't miss it. Please, you need to be, because it's impartation. These two next nights will impart some things to men and women, I believe. I really do. I believe, I believe it, too. Uh, Woo. Hallelujah. I said hallelujah. I want you to look around. Nobody will leave. Just look around. Just look around you. Nobody will leave. I tell you what, you bless me tonight, son. Joel, you bless me tonight. Man, you bless me tonight. That one, two, three, four. Don't you ever stop singing that. Because it comes from a grateful heart. We can hear your gratitude oozing out of, I don't know all your testimony. I don't know where you came from. But when you start singing that, it starts pouring out of you like, like what he put, oh. Beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. You, we, we can't, we, we did not plan for you to be here in the middle of a revival either. He was booked to come minister to our young people uh, and they were supposed to have something tonight. And this is an amazing guy because he's in demand all over the world and he's so kind and he never forgets where he came from. 
and uh, just came to be a blessing and gets up here and sings all night. He didn't go outside and smoke a cigarette while, while we were in here. I don't guess, I don't know. If you did, that's all right too. We still love you. You never know when the revival's going on, all kinds of prophetic stuff start flowing. <laughs> hey, some of you aren't craving it anymore. Have you noticed? When you get in God's presence, you can get free. We ought to have, we ought to have vape night and get rid of every vape. Oh, I just killed the revival. We ought to have vape night. The breath of God was breathed into your nostrils and that's where you became a living soul and Satan wants to take the breath out of you. He wants to shorten your life. It's not legalism. We're talking about life and death and God's purpose being fulfilled in all the days of your life. You don't have to die a premature death. He said, whom the Son sets free is free indeed. You don't have to live with it. You don't have to accept it. You're in an atmosphere of freedom in Jesus. Not bondage, not legalism, freedom. He gets bigger and all that stuff just washes out. Charles Spurgeon, Charles Spurgeon called it the explosive power of a new affection. And he called it like a bucket of water, a bucket that's full of water and he said, it's like taking a massive rock and dropping the rock into the bucket. And all of a sudden, it, the water slushes out because the rock just pushes it up. That's how you get delivered from drugs, alcohol, whatever. Jesus drops in. And when he drops in, in the glory, which is the heaviness, the weightiness of God, it causes all of that stuff. You just find yourself saying, I'm not gonna do that today. I'm not gonna do that today. I know I'm supposed to, but I'm making myself do it. I don't want it like I want it for I went to that revival. I don't crave it like, I don't feel like I need that like I needed it before I got touched in that service the other night. And when that starts happening, let it go. Let it go. Turn to somebody and say, don't accept anything that's not a gift from God. Every good gift comes from the Father of light. You don't have to accept it. Even if you picked it up along the way, you shame, condemnation, guilt, you don't have to accept it if it's not a gift from God. I give you power over all the power of the enemy. Nothing shall by any means hurt you, destroy you, end you. You can be free. You can be free and it'll become your testimony. I don't know where that came from. I'm supposed to just be ending the little service. But somebody needs to know that God has your number these next two nights. You're going to leave this revival with a brand new body, a brand new mind, a brand new spirit, a brand new future, a brand new name. Your name's not going to be alcoholic. Your name's not going to be drug addict. Your name's not going to be abuser. Your name is not going to be... Your name is not going to be anger. Your name is not going to be contention. Your name is not going to be shame. Your name is not going to be fear. Come on and praise him, somebody. If you believe he sets captives free.
You believe it? I know you do. I can see it on your face. Praise the Lord. Come here, Tim. We're almost done. Two minutes, three minutes. This is our pastor of our uh, church over, well, we soon to be in Alpharetta. Um, just tell somebody, he's a pastor. How long have you been a pastor? 10 years. Right. You started coming to church at Free Chapel when? 18 years ago. Why'd you come to Free Chapel? No longer bound attended. It was a recovery program. You were bound to what? Cocaine, alcohol, and every drug. Every drug. And now you're a pastor. Yes, sir. Yep. You went from a drug addict to a pastor. Yes, sir. Can God do it? He can do it. Anybody that wants to change, he'll do it. You get what you want. And when you want Jesus, that's what you get. If you want a chemical, you'll get that. But if you want Jesus, he'll give you everything. How, how, did, you, how did you stop? How did you quit doing it? Yeah, I mean, it was that bad. I was at rock bottom completely. I lost everything in my family. Um, all my friends, I was court ordered to a two year long program and um, I had nothing. I was mandated if I left, I went to jail to serve a two year sentence. So it was life or death. And now you're a pastor. Yes, sir. Now you're, you, you were headed for, to jail, but instead you got derailed. And now you're a pastor. Yes, sir. Yep. You. So how do you stop? How do you, 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 you had to have it. Yeah, pain. I don't want to go back to what I had. I had lost everything and, and that was my life. I had to have a chemical to fix it. So I kept going back to fix it, but eventually I had to face what I was running from. And Jesus was right there in the room the entire time. I'll never forget this pastor. I saw, well, hold your own microphone. I got a revelation that one day that Jesus was in the room when I thought I was alone, when I was drinking a 40 ounce and pulling out a mirror from under my bed, sniffing cocaine. I thought I was completely by myself, but one day through prayer and a group of people supported me. He gave me a revelation that he was there the whole time. He was in my bedroom the whole time. The Spirit of God waiting for me, protecting me. I had a family that prayed for me. While you were snorting cocaine, do you mean he was there? He didn't walk out when you were at your worst, when you were drinking a 40, when you, when you were, he didn't walk out? No, and that's why I turned. When I saw that love, that he loved me that much, I said, God, I'll do whatever you want. I'll serve you. I'll build churches. I'll go on mission trips. Whatever you want, I'm all yours. Because I knew that he was there the whole time. And it was just me that was far away. It was my heart that had been hardened. And I had judged people in church. My family was in church leadership. And I had a lot of judgment toward them and pastors and had hardened my heart and, and ran from God. So. And then God turned you into a church leader and a pastor. <laughs> yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus loves even me. Bible. Raise your hands and sing it one more time.
want to thank you for giving to this evangelist. Amazing offerings. What you gave, we're giving him. And it's over $150,000, this revival, so far. And if you're getting upset about that, you didn't even give any of it. What's he going to do with it? I don't care what he does with it. I know what he'll do with it. He'll win souls. He's not going to get but $500 of it. I know that for sure. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? God loves cheerful givers. So you can give online. We don't take up offerings. We just say give online. Y'all need to learn how to leave it up there a minute, though. Give online. You want to send this man to other places? Help him with his television. He doesn't have a large church. He doesn't pastor a church. He depends 100% on people just like you who God opens the door for him to preach. And he does it and lives by faith. And God has blessed him and will continue to bless him. And I'm delighted to sow seed in his ministry. I believe in him. I believe in his wife. I believe in his family. His whole family are precious. All right, raise your hand and receive the blessing. Go by the book table. He's out. Uh, I mean, uh, the giving stations are out there. If you want to give, just drop it in those little things or give online. God bless you. Receive this blessing. I mean, if you're going to try to be back Thursday and Friday night, there's no telling. Uh, do, do you have any CDs or anything? Or they don't sell them no more. Can they go online? When's your new thing coming out? Uh, sir? You got a brand new recording you just finished. Yes, sir. When is it coming out? It comes out February. When can we pre-order? We need to get it to the top. Uh, January, hopefully. January? Yeah, we'll try to have we, pre-order. We come January. back by sometime and just, when whenever, that's around. Whenever and, you want me to come. Oh, yeah. How many of you, have you, ha, do you have his stuff? Can they go online? And, yes, they can find me online. Uh, I'm asking you, you didn't ask me to do this. <laughs> Tell them how to get your music. I mean, you know, he wrote one, two, three, four. Mirrors, what, yeah. He, he wrote all, all the, most of the music you've heard tonight, much, much, much more. A lot of the songs we sing, he wrote. He's very talented, very anointed, and very kind and humble. Now, uh, tell them how to get your music. They can find me anywhere at Joel Barnes. Anywhere. They do what? They find me anywhere. Joel Barnes, you can find me on all of the platforms. Guys, throw it up there. Oh, God. Number one. One more. They're saying one more. It's up to you. It's up to okay. you. Okay. What are you I'm done. He's got it. Bless you. And then he'll you end with the God again. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you, make okay, his face shine on you, be gracious unto you, lift up his countenance let's upon you, give you peace. We love your online audience. If you can get here the next two nights, it's going to be glorious. You got it. We love you. One more time. Hands up. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Everybody sing. Singing, wandering into the night. And wanting a place to hide this weary soul. This bag of bones. And I tried with all my might, yeah. But I just can't win the fight. I'm slowly drifting. Oh, vagabond, yeah. But just when I ran out of road, I met a man I didn't know. And he told me that I was not alone. Y'all ready? Hey, me up, turn me around. Place my feet. Place my feet on solid ground. Sing, I thank the master. 
y'all. Have a good night. We'll see y'all tomorrow.